So, hello and uh, welcome everyone. We are actually 240 people here, live right now. And people are still dropping into the room. So this is uh, amazing. It, it will, I think this will be the largest webinar in the history of Positiva Pengar. And that's thanks to all of you that has shared this event, that has registered and decided to show up here today. So thank you so much everyone for, for this. So the topic today, it is money. Something we all use on a daily basis, but we seldom think about where does money actually comes from. Last years, this has started to change. More and more academics and journalists, they write about the source of modern digital money that private banks, they create new money ex nihilo, they create it out of thin air when they grant a loan. That this has serious negative consequences for the whole society. At previous webinars, we have talked about consequen consequences of that, so, such as social inequality, the financial crisis, debt and the housing bubbles, unfair competition on the payment markets, etc., etc. Today, it's time for analyzing a new aspect of the monetary system, the relationship between money creation and the climate threat. So therefore, we have invited uh, Professor Peter Ditch, and he's professor in practical philosophy uh, at the University of Victoria in Canada. Uh, I first met Peter at a workshop on financial ethics in, in Göteborg, where he had a brilliant keynote speech about money creation and the climate threat. So then, then I thought we just have to invite him for a, for a webinar with, with us. And we are super happy that you're here with us today, Peter. Many thanks for this. And um, before I give the word to you, just some practical details about uh, the organizers and uh, the webinar here. So first, who are we that are organizing this? So we, we partly consist of organizations from the international movement for monetary reform that exists in 29 countries now. So my name is Samuel and I'm from the Swedish branch of this organization, Positiva Pengar, it's called. And the other part of the organization consists of think tanks, grassroots organizations, climate organizations, etc., from different countries all over the world, working for a more sustainable and fair economy. And the event is also part of a campaign week, the week of action for social and climate justice. So right now, events, demonstrations, lectures, and protests are taking place actually all over our country. So we are not alone. Right now we are part of a movement of thousands of people acting for social and climate justice. Uh, and then second, uh, the agenda for the webinar. So the idea is to start with a presentation by Peter for around 40 minutes. Then we'll have a short break, 10 minutes. And then we will have a panel discussion. So we are proud and happy to be able to present an, an unique and interesting panel consisting of everything from financial experts to politicians and academic researchers. So George, that, that is a PhD student in financial ethics and is also a member of the board of Positiva Pengar. He will lead the panel discussion and he, he will also give our guests a proper introduction after the break. So with, uh, with that said, uh, the stage is yours, Peter. You can take over this, the screen sharing here. Um... Thank you very much, uh, Samuel, for your kind introduction and for the invitation, both to you, to Positiva Pengar and to all your partners. I know how much work goes into setting something like this up. Uh, and I'm excited to work the, to present this work here to a to a broader audience because I think it it really lends itself to that purpose. The, the The central message of what I want to say today is relatively intuitive, and that's in a nutshell that um, the current monetary arrangements that we have in our society, especially the interplay between the central bank and the commercial banks, uh, pose a serious obstacle to climate mitigation. 
Um, and as a starting point, let me, uh, well, let me first of all, start sharing my screen um, so you can see the presentation as I go along. I hope you can see that now. So as a starting point, I would like you to consider the fact that there seems to be a kind of consensus among policymakers today uh, that public funding will be insufficient to manage the green transition and that we somehow need to incentivize private funding to participate uh, in this process. So for instance, if you look um, at the EU Green Deal Investment Plan, it aims, as you see here, to crowd in private funding. Uh, the same holds for the US Inflation Reduction Act, which is billed as one of the biggest uh, pieces of climate, climate legislation that we've seen. Uh, the OECD, the IMF, through uh, staff uh, reports go in, in, in similar directions. I've cited two here on the screen. And even the IPCC, which is, if you like, the, um, the, the authority on, on climate change, uh, says that private finance is a, a side critical enabler for accelerated climate action. So what I want to try and convince you today is that this hope that is placed here in all these instances into private finance as a tool for climate mitigation is misplaced. Uh, don't get me wrong, I think that the measures taken by all these bodies uh, and by the legislators in question are well-intentioned and that we have all reasons to believe that the subsidies that are provided for green technologies uh, will actually lead to significant investments in solar panels, home insulation, uh, and so on. But unfortunately, that in itself does not solve the problem. To solve the problem, these green investments would have to reduce emissions. They would have to replace fossil fuels to reduce emissions. And that's where I think uh, we encounter a problem. So I'll argue uh, in, in the next uh, 40 minutes that there are two features of modern economies that make it that it's unlikely the case that all this investment into uh, green technology will actually replace fossil fuels. Now, I'll, I'll just name these features now and then we'll go into more detail to understand what they are. The first of these is the unconditional delegation of broad money creation to private financial institutions. Now, I'll unpack that sentence in a moment, but uh, it, basically the central bank outsources a lot of the money creation to commercial banks without imposing conditions, and that, I argue, is a problem. The second feature uh, that is necessary for this uh, for these unfortunate consequences to unfold is the fact that the negative externalities of greenhouse gas emissions are only partially corrected for. Again, I'll get into uh, more detail in a moment, but when these two conditions occur at the same time, unconditional money delegation to commercial banks and incompletely corrected externalities, I argue that private finance is actually a problem rather than a solution in the context of uh, climate mitigation. So let's start by analyzing those two features that I've uh, just mentioned um, one by one, starting with the monetary arrangements of our society. <clears throat> so most of what the most of what the older ones uh, uh, among us associate intuitively with money, namely notes and coins, is actually only a small part of the money in a modern economy. Right? Uh, it's also known as narrow money, and this narrow money uh, represents only two to five percent of money in most rich countries today. Uh, by contrast, most money in the category called broad money takes the form of bank deposits. Now, this term bank deposit misleadingly suggests that there is someone who goes to the bank, deposits an amount in the bank where it's now sitting, waiting for them to come and pick it up again. Now, people do, of course, deposit money in that sense, but most bank deposits actually come out in a different way. Uh, Samuel already alluded to it in the introduction. They're created by commercial banks out of thin air. You go to the bank, you ask for a mortgage, a button is pushed, and there is the money. Now, this raises the question of why commercial banks have this power to create money. In modern economies today, uh, the answer lies in an institutional division of labor that we have between central banks on the one hand and commercial banks on the other hand. Um, Robert Hockett and uh, uh, Saul Omarova have dubbed this arrangement the finance franchise. Right? And they point out that uh, two questions arise for the monetary arrangements in our society today. How much credit to create, one, and how to allocate that credit, two. Right? And here's the answer they give. I quote from one of their papers, the first task, that of modulating the credit supply, 
is officially reserved to the franchisor, acting primarily through the central bank or monetary authority that conducts its monetary policy. The second task, that of allocating credit, is generally, generally delegated to private franchisees, including banks and other financial institutions." End of quote. So in other words, the central bank takes care of the first task to make, su make sure that certain macroeconomic goals are met, especially inflation targeting and so on. By contrast, the actual allocation of the credit is delegated to private banks. Why is that so? Now, the usual argument that is given here is one uh, that alludes to uh, Austrian economist um, Friedrich Hayek, who pointed out that commercial banks are closer to the decentralized information in the economy and therefore will uh, take decisions that uh, lead to a more efficient allocation of resources. So that's why we've got this arrangement that we outsource the allocation of credit to private financial institutions. Now, of course, this is only a sketch, but that's all we need of the finance franchise here. Right? We could also talk about the role of the shadow banking sector, of capital markets, et cetera, but that would complicate things too much for present purposes. I want to stick here to the essentials, and I want to now point out two aspects of the finance franchise that are important for us when we think about climate change. The first of these is um, that it's important to note that there's no principal limit to the money creation in the system. Right? It's not like under the gold standard or in a fractional reserve banking system where the quantity of money is capped. Cap in the gold standard, you can only create as much money as there is gold. Right? Now, of course, there is uh, a prudential limit from a macroeconomic perspective. You don't want to create so much money that there'll be inflation. Right? This is something that we actually see uh, in, the, in the current uh, context, but that's a different debate. Right? But importantly, from the perspective of the individual private financial institution, from the individual commercial bank, the effective limit on credit creation is whether the creditor in question is good for the money. Will they pay it back? Right? If they were, if they're able to pay it back, the bank will make a profit and therefore the bank has an incentive to extend that credit. So there's no limited principle for commercial banks to create money. Right? Now, in the context of climate change, this means that as long as banks expect fossil fuel projects to be profitable, they will extend credit to them. Right. We'll come back to this later, but you can already see why this why this is important. Here's the second aspect of the finance franchise that I want to underline. Suppose you walk into your local bank. Uh, we're you know, hosted in Sweden today, so let's take uh, Handelsbanken. Right? You walk into Handelsbanken, you apply for a mortgage. Once the money to buy your house is in your account, it's of course true that you hold a mortgage with a private bank, with Handelsbanken. Right? However, notice that Handelsbanken could not have granted you the mortgage without the backing of the central bank or of any other relevant uh, monetary authority. So this puts the focus in this finance franchise on the role of the fran franchisor, the central bank that um, oversees all this money creation. And in any credit creation by fin private financial institutions, central banks are involved in three different and important ways. To see the first two, ask yourself why the person who you're buying a house from with your Handelsbank mortgage actually accepts the money that Handelsbank has just created. And the answer is that they accept it because the Swedish central bank, Sveriges uh, at Riksbank, accommodates and monetizes the mortgage. It's this approval process that turns the private liability of Handelsbank into a publicly recognized liability issued in Swedish krona. That's why other people accept this money. Now we can see um, now why the image of a finance franchise is very apt, right? Just as you can't walk into a, 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 a cafe to get a Starbucks cafe if that establishment has not signed an agreement with the Starbucks corporation, you cannot get a loan that is denominated in public tender from a commercial bank without the central bank's approval. Uh, so that, that, that those are the first two ways here, uh, accommodation and monetization, that are important in backing up what the commercial banks are doing. The third way in which central banks are involved in private money creation is a little bit more indirect and a bit more technical. So I'll give you a, a slightly simplified version here. Just as you and I need some money in our account to meet our day-to-day -day needs, to buy things and so on, commercial banks also need a special sort of money to settle their accounts among themselves. And this special sort of money is called 
central bank reserves. Now, in order to access this special kind of money, commercial banks need to provide the central bank with some assets for security. What assets they can use to do that is specified in what is called the collateral framework of the central bank. Now, it's easy to see that it matters what's included on this list of the collateral framework. If any particular asset, a sovereign bond, a commercial bond, a mortgage-backed security uh, is included here, this is advantageous for the issuer of that asset because it makes the secondary market in that asset much more liquid. As we'll see in a moment, this is also relevant in the context of climate change. So in sum, what I want to say here is that uh, any credit creation by commercial banks that is denominated in uh, uh, legal tender has an irreducibly public component. This is not just a, a private market uh, operation. It's backed by the central bank. Now, remember <clears throat> that I told you that we would look into two conditions of modern economies. Uh, the first one was this finance franchise. The second one um, is uh, the question of externalities. We can be a little bit quicker here because this is really uh, economics uh, 101. So the promise of a market mechanism lies in an efficient allocation of resources to their most productive use. However, there's a snag. We know that real markets are prone to market failure. There are asymmetries of information. There's non-private goods. Agents have market power, which they're not supposed to in this model. And most relevantly in the context of climate change, there are negative externalities from pollution. So when fossil fuel producers and consumers only pay the private cost of their activity, but not the social cost or the externality that affects humanity as a whole in the form of climate change, then we'll end up with too much of the good or service that involves fossil fuels that is produced at too low a price. On the diagram here, we will end up at QP rather than at the efficient level of production, which would be at a lower quantity and a higher price, Q star and P star. Right. Now, the consequences of these non-internalized greenhouse gas emissions are significant. We've got rising temperatures, we've got extreme weather events, loss of biodiversity, and we already have an estimated 5 million deaths per year rising rapidly attributed to climate change. Um, so all this, as I already mentioned, I feel like is basic economics. So let's move to two observations that are perhaps not as mainstream and that are important for us uh, in this context. Um, the first is that in principle, we have policy of tools available to correct for this market failure. For example, we can impose a carbon tax that is equivalent to the social cost, which would lead producers and consumers to move from QP in the diagram here to Q star and P star. Unfortunately, in practice, carbon prices are nowhere near where they would need to be for this complete internalization of social costs. Right? Uh, and there are several reasons for that. Only about 20% of carbon emissions are actually subject to carbon taxes today. Second, those carbon taxes tend to be too low. And third, the consumption habits of the rich, uh, who tend to emit most, are usually relatively priced inelastic, which means that carbon taxes are less effective. You know, you impose a carbon tax on someone who's got a lot of money, well, they might not change their behavior that much, in other words. So in sum, what we've got here is a situation of incompletely corrected externalities. There's a market failure, and we're not doing enough to correct for it. Now, there's a little uh, uh, addendum here that I want to add before putting our two features together, and that is someone might object that even if markets fail today, financial markets are better than that. They will price in climate mitigation and therefore the decline of fossil fuel assets. And I just want to give you some reasons for why I think that this argument does not go through. In other words, I want to try and convince you that financial markets will fail too and will not uh, be able to correct this problem that we've just uh, identified. So there's, there's a number of reasons here. Let me uh, go through some of them. Um, the first is that at least for now, fossil fuel assets are far from stranded. Stock, uh, stocks of fossil fuels are at record valuations today. Um, and even those kinds of asset that, assets that did have trouble accessing conventional capital for a while, such as coal, sometimes find other innovative financial means to access financing after all. Second reason is that um, 
Some experts, including current and former central bankers, Mark Carney chief among them, uh, have made it their task to point out that financial markets are actually not very good at pricing in climate change risk. Uh, part of the mission of the Network for Greening the Financial System, NGFS, which was uh, in part set up by Mark Carney, uh, who's the, the former governor of the Bank of England and the Bank of Canada, actually, is to make sure that financial institutions have a better informational basis to assess these kinds of climate risks. Then again, we know from the financial crisis that financial markets have a weakness when it comes to assessing systemic risk and climate change uh, risk is uh, um, an emblematic example for this kind of systemic risk. Third reason why financial markets are not gonna do much better is that even if financial institutions have the capacity to properly assess uh, climate change risk, it's not always clear that they have the incentive to do so. Right? Uh, they have the incentive to make money uh, and that's the incentive that uh, they put first. Fourth reason, uh, central banks have actually over the last 15 years encouraged financial institutions to take more risks. Right? Part of the rationale of the huge asset purchases of quantitative easing uh, on markets uh, was and is to provide financial institutions with liquidity for riskier lending in order to stimulate the economy. Right? And lending to fossil fuels is actually part of that category. So one might even say that central banks have encouraged this kind of lending. And finally, uh, the fifth reason uh, is perhaps the most significant one. Note that the stranded asset scenario that the financial markets are supposed to price in can come about in two ways. Either because the econ economy collapses due to some rapid and severe climate change, or because we do what we saw on the previous slide that is not happening today, namely we correct for negative externalities in a more systematic way that renders these fossil fuel investments unprofitable. Right? Now we've, we've just seen that financial markets are not very good at evaluating the first of these two scenarios. In other words, the rapid collapse. Uh, as to the second, I think it seems entirely rational for them not to bet on it. In other words, they are betting on the fact that we continue to not correct for these massive externalities. Uh, and the fossil fuel interests have such an influence on governments uh, that it seems entirely plausible to anticipate that they continue to bet on the fact that they'll get away with it, in which case financial markets will not uh, significantly contribute to the internalization of uh, externalities. So where does this all this leave us? I think we now have all the tools in place to see what happens when the two conditions that I started out with uh, are fulfilled simultaneously. In other words, what happens when the unconditional broad money creation that we delegate to commercial banks meets a context of incompletely corrected externalities. Now, the first thing to note here uh, is, is the following staggering observation. Uh, private financial institutions keep pumping a lot of money into fossil fuel projects. And so here's a quote uh, from the Banking on Climate Chaos Report 2023. Uh, and you see that the 60 largest bank banks have um, pumped 5.5 trillion into fossil fuels in the last seven years, in other words, since the Paris Agreement. Now about half of that is lending. The other half is, is, um, uh, is from underwriting activity, in other words, from issuing uh, stocks and bonds. But half of 5.5 trillion is still a lot of money. Um, now, from the perspective of standard economic theory, this would seem at least somewhat puzzling. After all, Governments are starting to heavily subsidize green energy. Remember, that's what that's the observation that we started out with. And one would expect this heavy push for green energy to lead to some kind of substitution effect, where more investment, investment for green projects will go hand in hand with a reduction of investment for fossil fuel projects. But that's not happening. Now, given the two features of modern economies that we've just discussed, unconditional broad money creation by commercial banks, and incompletely corrected externalities, we can solve this puzzle. Right? Here's how the explanation goes. It's true that the subsidies for green technologies increase the relative attractiveness of green technologies, but they don't do anything to reduce the absolute attractiveness of fossil fuel investments. Right? And given that financing is not inherently scarce because the way we set up our monetary arrangements under the finance franchise, as long as fossil fuel projects are profitable, 
they will get financed. And since their externalities remain incompletely corrected for, they remain profitable. So to put it differently, under current monetary arrangements, the substitution effect that classical economics would, would uh, or neoclassical economics too, would, would suggest here is to a large extent suspended. More money for green projects simply doesn't mean less money for fossil fuel projects. Now, it's easy to see that that's a huge problem for the green transition. Right? When broad money is created through loans by final, uh, private financial institutions without any limits other than expected profitability, and when this occurs in a context of incompletely corrected externalities, then this creates incentives for more generation of externalities. And this is why it seems to me that private finance in the present context represents a serious obstacle to the path to net zero rather than an enabler as uh, hoped for by the EU, by the US, OECD, et cetera, and even the IPCC. So this situation reminds me a little bit of that of Sisyphus, right? um, who's given the futile task of pushing this boulder, you've got the picture here, to the summit. right? And whenever he gets close, he finds himself set back to the bottom of the hill with the boulder. In a similar way, by pumping all that money into green technologies, we think that we're getting closer to meeting our climate targets, only to find that private finance to fossil fuels continues to flow pretty much unabated. So if that's true, if, if what I've said so far is correct, um, I think it has serious interpretation, serious consequences for how we should interpret the world and how we should act in it in order to try and meet our climate targets. Uh, let me look at some of the broader normative implications first, and then uh, in a second step, we will, uh, we will turn to policy reform questions. Um, so the normative implications. The most, most fundamental insight from all of this uh, is that the, the standard justification for our present monetary arrangements actually breaks down. Recall something that I said earlier. I said earlier that the reason why the justification that is given why we delegate money creation or credit allocation to commercial banks is because this supposedly directs resources to their most efficient use. Well, under conditions of incompletely corrected externalities, that's not the case too much goes to fossil fuels. So markets fail to internalize the social costs and thus significantly over provide capital to fossil fuels compared to what, be, what would be efficient from an economic perspective. We're not even talking about uh, um, climate targets explicitly, but from an economic perspective, the investment needed for fossil fuels is lower. Now at this point, it's tempting to, to blame the commercial banks who are providing this funding. A lot of activism in this context fall into, falls into this category. So, for instance, you know, I, I regularly get emails from uh, from Greenpeace, uh, some of whose members are, are are present here, asking me to tell banks to stop uh, funding fossil fuels. Right? Now, I think these campaigns are aiming at least partially for the wrong target. Right? As we've seen, private financial institutions could not extend these loans on their own. Central banks are implicated in this, they're deeply implicated in this because they uh, are involved through accommodation, monetization, and through the design of their collateral frameworks, as we saw earlier. So in other words, there is no lending to the fossil fuel sector without public approval. And the central bank might be able to outsource credit allocation, but it cannot outsource responsibility for it. Ultimately, the central bank uh, is where the buck stops. Right? We could go even further and say, since the central bank is an institution that is mandated by governments, and since, at least in democracies, these governments are elected by the people, we all share responsibility for the continued financing of fossil fuels. And so from that perspective, you might say, we get what we deserve. We tolerate the system. We're complicit in the system. Having said that, this points to a significant tension between the official discourse of governments to mitigate climate change on the one hand, uh, and the fact that another public institution, namely the central bank, is overseeing massive lending to the fossil fuel sector on the other hand. Right? So if you like, the left hand of government is undermining the already insufficient actions of the right hand. Now, uh, it's both important and in instructive to see how and why central banks themselves, as you can see, they're a central actor in all this, central banks themselves will contest the narrative that I've just presented. 
um, I argue that they're actually burying their heads in the sand to some extent. Um, and from a strategic point of view, central bankers clearly have an incentive to ignore their responsibility in all of this. They prefer money creation to be depoliticized because that protects their operational independence. They are an institution at one step removed from elected government, and they want to keep it that way. Right? Um, they also emphasize, and here they have a point to some extent, that their current mandates do not ask them to take into account climate change considerations unless they impact price stability, so unless they impact what is in the mandate. Right? So in some central bankers, uh, like to suggest that they really don't have much to do with climate change. Right? Here's a statement by Mark Carney, who, we, who we've already encountered earlier, that's emblematic for this uh, for this position. Uh, he says that financial policymakers will not drive the transition to a low carbon economy. Financial policymakers do, however, have a clear interest in ensuring the financial system is resilient to any transition. Our uh, role uh, can lie in developing the frameworks that help the market itself to adjust efficiently. Now, against the background of what I've said, this statement seems on the wrong track in two respects. Right? The first is that the hope in the efficient working of markets in the face of externalities seems misplaced. As we've seen, it's that's just not happening in the context of climate change. Right? And second, <clears throat> it's important to realize that the unconditional money creation overseen by central banks actually slows down the green transition. So rather than being an agent who has little to do with this transition, who's not driving it as Carney claims here, central banks are actually sabotaging the green transition. Um, now, there are some signs of progress in the central banking community, but there is still a considerable disconnect between the discourse and the self-perception uh, of central bankers as, if you like, innocent bystanders to climate change on the one hand, and the reality of significant fossil fuel lending uh, uh, that um, we see and that is happening under their watch. Uh, so when Jerome Powell, for instance, the, uh, uh, the head of the federal US Federal Reserve says, we are not climate policymakers. This was the last sentence of an important speech on this subject he, he gave uh, um, recently. I think the statement calls for interpretation and for a little more nuance. But on the one hand, Powell has a point in that the mandate of the Federal Reserve, as of other most other central banks today, does not ask them to act on climate considerations. On the other hand, in light of the argument of this paper and of other work that is uh, that is being produced today, it's plainly false to assert that the Federal Reserve is not a climate policy maker. Unfortunately, it's a climate policy maker of the wrong sort. Namely, uh, its actions approve massive fossil fuel lending by commercial banks and thereby slow down rather than accelerate the green transition. Now, in order to have a chance to meet our climate targets, that needs to change. So what can we do in order to change it? What can we do in terms of policy reform uh, um, to try to solve these problems? Now, I don't have the time to go into too much detail here, but let me sketch the broad outlines. Right? Recall that the monetary arrangements of a modern economy um, are faced with a double task, modulating the credit supply on the one hand and allocating credit on the other. And the way we do it these days is that the central bank tries to modulate the amount of credit there is, while the commercial banks decide where the credit goes. Now, that framing, those two tasks, provide us with two possible and complementary policy reform paths. We can either reduce credit creation altogether, hoping then that less will go to fossil fuels as well, or we can work to steer it into a different direction. Within the credit we have, less to fossil fuels, more to green stuff. Um, so let's start with the, with the first option, which I call uh, here uh, definancialization. Right. Um, Financialization is actually perhaps the most important trend that has contributed to the explosion of credit and money creation by commercial banks in recent decades. Uh, financialization includes, for instance, a securitization of assets that then serve as collateral on lending markets. So one way uh, to reduce the credit supply 
uh, is by definancializing. Right? Now, what does that mean? Here's a non-comprehensive list of tools that one could use in this process. Um, <clears throat> so for instance, one could reactivate, reactivate more robust reserve requirements for commercial banks. In other words, when they give out loans, we, have to, we would require them to keep a higher fraction of their loans in reserve. That would both improve financial stability, but also impose a cap on credit creation. Second, we could change collateral frameworks, for instance, on repo markets, which is a part of the interbank lending market. Today, more and more assets can serve as collateral on this and other uh, markets. By making this more restrictive, one would restrict the access of commercial banks to liquidity, which in turn would restrict their ability to hand out loans. And finally, at the extreme, one could turn commercial banks into what they're often misinterpreted to be already, namely mere intermediaries. In other words, this would mean taking away the ability to create money and requiring them to get deposits from people before they can hand out loans. Um, now, these are pretty radical uh, measures, and someone might object that throttling the credit supply in our economy in this way across the board would have negative uh, uh, consequences on the economy, notably in terms of employment. Right? Now, I think that actually depends on how one does it, um, but I think the objection certainly lends uh, more plausibility to the second policy response, and that is uh, an active credit policy that tries to steer funding towards green energy and away from fossil fuels. So that's the, uh, uh, the second option that you see on the, uh, on the screen here. Uh, rather than writing commercial banks a blank check when it comes to money creation, right, dele to them, delegated to them unconditionally, we could and should, from the perspective that I uh, adopt here, be more selective about this. Now, again, this can be done in different ways. Uh, and what you see here on the slide is, is running from more moderate to more radical uh, policy reforms. So starting with a more moderate proposal, um, if a commercial bank has a certain percentage of fossil fuel lending in their portfolio, uh, the central bank could charge higher interest um, when that bank wants to borrow from the central bank. Or um, the central bank could say, look, uh, we will not bail you out if you run into financial trouble if you have uh, more than a certain threshold of financial um, lending on your portfolio. One can, could impose credit quotas, for instance, a maximum percentage of a bank's lending that can go to fossil fuels. Notice, uh, interestingly, that these were the kinds of policies that were relatively common in the post-war period, uh, but that have been put on the back burner um, uh, more recently. And finally, uh, perhaps most effectively, but also most radically, the central bank could simply refuse to monetize fossil fuel loans. That is, refuse to recognize them as legal tender. Right? If they did that, the music would stop immediately and no, no commercial bank would lend to fossil fuels. Um, so these are some of the options that we could go for, either throttle the credit supply altogether or direct it into a more uh, productive direction. Now, someone might object that such a credit policy would represent an unjustified form of government intervention. Right? But I think that this objection is based on a misunderstanding of how our monetary arrangements actually work in practice. We already have government intervention. None of the lending by commercial banks, as we've seen, would be possible without the approval of the central bank. So all that we're debating here is what kind of government intervention we want. Do we want one that includes fossil fuels or one that doesn't or doesn't to the same extent that we see today? Um, let me add two additional points here. Uh, the first is uh, that many central bankers will think that such a proposal is, is crazy, this kind of credit policy. Right? They will point out that independent central banks have no business picking winners and losers in the economy. But I think two components of this objection have to be disentangled, and those are the two points that I want to underline here. First, the question of whether central banks pick winners and losers requires some kind of benchmark against which winning and losing is defined. Now, it might be true that an unconditional finance franchise does not pick winners and losers relative to the market benchmark, but as we've seen, the market benchmark is an undesirable one in the presence of significant negative externalities. The relevant benchmark is one that allows us to meet our climate targets. Realistically, you know, if we're really optimistic, 
keeping climate change within two percent uh, to uh, two degrees centigrade. Now, measured by this benchmark, central bankers are already picking winners and losers. As we've seen, they're unduly supporting fossil fuel lending. So on this part of the objection, I would argue that central, central bankers uh, are simply on the wrong track when they say um, that, you know, they, as an independent institution, they should do something like this because it's, uh, it's political. They're already being political. Second, however, they have a point when they say, the central bankers, that is, that it's problematic for an independent central bank to make these political choices. And I agree that we have to find a new formula here that the current separation between central banks and, and uh, legislatures is perhaps um, in need of, a, uh, of an overhaul. Okay, so let me, uh, let me conclude. Uh, what I've tried to show and argue is that private finance is neither private uh, nor uh, an enabler of the green transition, at least under the current monetary arrangements that we have. When two conditions are fulfilled, unconditional broad money delegation to commercial banks in a context of incompletely corrected externalities, the incentive to fund fossil fuels persist and emissions will not go down. As we've seen, this, this substitution effect is suspended. You know, we can pump as much money as we want into green, uh, fossil fuel lending will still continue. Right? So what, what should we learn from this? We should learn that there's an imperative not just to subsidize the good stuff, but actually to defund the bad stuff that is creating the emissions. Um, now, one challenge that we meet in, in trying to do that is the fact that those who are best placed to play this role, namely the central banks, um, tend to renounce it. They, 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 they want nothing to do with it as it stands. And I think that needs to, that needs to change. Now, let me close with a, with a little observation on the concept of stranded assets. So I think it's interesting to see that the, the talk of stranded assets suggests that there'll be some kind of exogenous shock through which these assets suddenly lose their value. Uh, you know, it's like a ship in the storm, you all of a sudden you end up on the beach. Now, if this paper, or if, if my work here is correct, then this is actually misleading. Assets don't strand by themselves. We have to make the political decisions that strand them. And that will not happen as long as we allow them to have value. Right? And by providing unconditional broad money, we are allowing them to have value. That's, I think, irresponsible, and that, that has to stop. Thank you for your attention. I look forward to uh, both the panel and the discussion later on. Uh, welcome back to the second part uh, of our webinar on banks and climate change, which will be a discussion uh, first among a panel of experts and then uh, with you, all of you in the audience. Uh, my name is Georg Schmerzek. I'm a pet member of Positiva Benger, uh, just as Samuel, who did the first introduction, and I'm also a doctoral candidate in financial ethics at Gothenburg University, and I'll be moderating the second part of the webinar. So what we'll be discussing is the role that banks and the monetary system more generally um, play in climate change and how things could change. Yeah? This will be a particular focus. What would be um, desirable ways of improving the situation that we are in. Um, to do so, we've invited a panel of experts from different backgrounds, and I'd like to introduce them to you very quickly. If you could all turn on your camera who are on the panel, that would be great. Wonderful. So we'll start by ladies first. Um, we have with us Janine Alm Eriksson, who is a member of the Swedish parliament since 2014. Uh, she is uh, with the Swe Swedish Green Party, and she's the economic spokesperson and particularly interested in questions of climate change. Furthermore, we have Max Jernek, who is a researcher at the Swedish think tank uh, Catalyst, focusing on full employment, uh, inflation, and climate change. He holds a PhD in sociology and has worked as a researcher at the Stockholm School of Economics. Furthermore, we have um, Karl Schlitter, uh, who is the campaign leader for system change and the environment at Greenpeace Sweden. He holds a degree in chemical engineering and he was a member of the European Parliament and the Swedish Parliament for the Green Party for more than 10 years. Uh, last but not least, we have Björn Eriksson, uh, who is the leader and spokesperson of uh, Kontant Upru Red, if I pronounced that correctly, a Swedish civil society organization that aims to promote the availability of cash in society. 
He holds a degree in economics and has served in various roles in Swedish politics and uh, Swedish and international civil service. So before we start with the discussion, uh, I'd like to um, do a, bit, a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, we have a Q&A function um, uh, in, in the Zoom room in which every one of you in the audience is very welcome to post questions and to look at the questions that others have posted and then to upvote them in case you want them to be asked. After the discussion with the experts, we'll have a look at you know these questions and the ones that are most highly asked, uh, most highly ranked, and we'll invite you to ask those questions to the panel of experts. Okay, so to get the discussion started, I would like to um, just give a brief recap of two very uh, important points I think in in Professor Deitch's talk, uh, and the first one is that um, as a matter of fact banks lend a very substantial amount of money to fossil fuel companies. Yeah, that the, the figure that Peter Ditsch uh, mentioned is about 5.5 trillion. Uh, we've calculated if we only take lending, this uh, boils down to an order of magnitude of approximately 1 billion US dollars every day that um, banks have uh, loaned to the fossil fuel industry in the past seven years. And these loans, evidently enable the production of fossil fuels which drive climate change and destroy our planet. So for sure this is a bad aspect about banks business but one might say you know it's sort of deplorable but banks are private companies just like any other and so there's no reason to worry about banks in particular. However I think this is where you know the second point of, of Peter's presentation comes in uh, and that is to say that when banks lend out money they are not doing a normal economic activity like any other company, but they are actually exerting the privilege of money creation, which our public institutions have conferred upon them. And arguably, when banks use this privilege of money creation to issue huge loans to the fossil fuel expansion, then they are using a public privilege in a socially detrimental way. And it's, it's not really surprising when the public and, and, and its institutions which delegate this money creation privilege to the banks start considering whether they should possibly restrict this privilege or take it back. Peter has, has basically proposed two options along these lines. The first one is to prohibit banks from creating money for fossil fuel expansion. And the second one is to roll back the money creation privileges of banks more generally. Um, now, in the panel discussion, we would like to hear opinions uh, on these uh, and, and possibly other proposals that you might bring in from a wide variety of viewpoints. Um, as I mentioned, we'll start with a round of questions for all the participants, uh, for, the, for all the panelists, and then we'll have a more open uh, question format. Um, so it would be great if all of the panelists could keep their responses uh, below, say, five minutes um, so that everybody gets to speak and the public uh, also gets a uh, possibility to talk. Um, we've invited uh, a representative of um, the banking industry who has unfortunately not showed up, although he uh, promised to be here, Sasha Berschlik. Um, I would have liked to start with his uh, take on, on this matter, but as he's not here, um, we'll just uh, jump the question that I had prepared for him and, and head on uh, to the environmental movement. Um, we've got a representative of that movement uh, with us. Uh, this is Karl Schlichter, Schlitter from Greenpeace, uh, which is one of uh, the world's largest environmental organizations, as you all know. Um, Carl, you're a campaign leader at Greenpeace, um, and I'm I'm wondering what you think um, about basically banks lending to the fossil fuel sector. Is is that a problem to the environment? Presumably, you would say yes. Uh, Peter mentioned in his uh, presentation that he's often being contacted by your organization for precisely that reason, um, and. Uh, well, I mean, like the, the question, of course, is uh, what you think should be done and by whom? Um, Peter, if I understood him correctly, thinks that banks themselves are the wrong targets and that we should rather target their ability to issue loans for socially destructive purposes, yeah? be it in the form of some kind of credit guidance 
or to take away their privilege to create money out of nowhere in the first place. Yeah. So are these proposals that you are considering at Greenpeace? Uh, what's your view on this? And uh, do you have any other options that you would like to bring into discussion with regards to, you know, um, decreasing the damage that banks do uh, to the environment? Well, thank you very much, and thank me, thank you for being able to participate here, and thank Peter for your presentation. Uh, I'm sorry to say it's not going to be a conflict now regarding uh, who we should target, because I totally agree that this is a flaw of the system itself and how it's designed, and it should be changed on a political level and by central banks. Uh, I have no illusion that private banks would do anything uh, else than making a profit and they need a new rule set. Uh, and this new rule set, I agree totally with Peter, uh, that we should change this. And, and Greenpeace has been targeting both these dimensions. Uh, we have a current work ongoing calling a bankrolling extinction, which also is not only speaking about climate change. Banks also fund forest companies and other companies' destruction of nature and agricultural business destruction of nature. Uh, so we see that uh, the lending also goes to a double whammy against our survival, both by diversity and climate. And the reason this is, is exactly what Peter described uh, today. With the fractional reserve banking, almost all money today in, 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 the, in the world is created by private banks. When money is created by this way, it's per definition created by loans. So you have constantly increasing debt. Uh, this has two very concrete effects. One is uh, that uh, in order to repay all these debts, you need always growth. Growth cannot be avoided. You have to target the society towards growth, otherwise you will have a collapse of the financial system. Uh, so all technological development or a, a lot of the technological development will be targeting to increase production in order to, you know, keep the system alive any change of this policy would disrupt the system and you would have a financial crisis uh, so you automatically then use our technological development to create growth rather than reduce emissions and, and you know more free time and other options you could do to use our technological development so you have a lock-in effect and change and therefore i totally agree with peter that currently uh, the financial system is not a promoter of change, but rather conserving old-fashioned structures. The second thing is a little bit more complicated and linked a lot to Wilkinson and um, Pickett research on inequality. Uh, when you have private banks creating debt, you will see a centralization of profits uh, to the people owning the banks. The, per definition, every new euro or dollar or Swedish crown that is created will increase social inequality. Uh, so with the current system, you have increased social inequality. And this itself is also negative for the environment. You see a very strong correlation between increased social injustice and reduced uh, energy efficiency, resource efficiency, and social um, content, uh, how, pe how happy people are. You also see an increased level of stress. So all these factors negatively contribute to higher emissions. So it's, it's beyond the fact that the current financial system still finance fossil fuel companies and so on. It's the system as it is constructed that automatically create an incessant need for growth, which will then gear the development towards growth rather than reducing emissions. And you will have this increased inequality per definition. You might do some redistribution policies, but the pre-distribution policy of the system is very unequal. And therefore you will attack the possibility of focusing our development for reducing impacts on biodiversity and climate and social justice and therefore you will not be able to quickly reduce the emissions in a way that is socially just in a way that makes people 
safe and good in the transition. So our analysis is that you really need to change exactly the things that Peter talked about. Not only, you know, some small rules regarding how banks should invest, but the fundamentals of the system, how fractional reserve banking should be reformed, maybe all the way to full reserve banking, uh, but at least in that direction. Uh, and then also, uh, that is part of the system change work. The the Greenpeace globally in the coming three years, we are going to have a move towards a system logic on our view on how financial systems should change. And we are going to see work more targeting beyond growth and then attacking the underlying causes of the financial system that are limiting us from developing as humans and as societies to having less stress on our planet, less stress on people, less stress on our biodiversity systems. This is where we would like to go. And the pathway there is strictly regulating the shadow banking system, the current financial system. And then as part of that, we have our campaigns against fossil fuel industry. But Greenpeace have come to the conclusion in the last maybe decade gradually that it's not enough to stop you know, bankrolling fossil fuel companies. It, it's not enough because the money will go to other extractive industries, other destruction of our planet and ecosystem. So we need to change the fundamental architecture of the system, which was done in a time when the limiting factor on our well-being was our capacity to transform nature to things that made our lives comfortable. Today, the limiting factor is not that. We have the technical capacity to make everybody on this planet live a comfortable life. We don't have the social tools yet to distribute this uh, in a way that it's actually functioning, but we have the technical capacity for it. And therefore, we should focus our development on limiting our financial economic activities within the planetary boundaries that are exceeded so much now. So I thank Peter for showing like why this change would be important. I would like to reinforce it, why it's a fundamental system error in how we have designed our financial system. It's designed for, it's designed for another time when increased production was the main you know, benefit for humanity in order to overcome poverty and starvation and, and actual physical limits to our comforts. We now have a different system logic and we should change our economic system accordingly. And therefore, I like Peter's suggestions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Carl. That was an interesting contribution. So if I understand it correctly, you agree because you are arguing for, in the first place, maybe more regulation uh, of banks in, 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 in their credit issuance. And in a second step, perhaps um, a, a general reduction um, of credit issuance by banks, perhaps in the favor of uh, more public credit issuance for public projects and uh, perhaps also in the interest of just reducing growth in, in general. Yeah, that a fair yeah, and, uh, yeah uh, I mean, not only perhaps, we want this, we say this. Mm -hmm. And also um, we, we see that uh, Peter's points on, on um, stability is really important too. Uh, you know, anybody has an insurance on their house today I, I'm sure everybody here in this meeting has some kind of insurance for their car or their house. And uh, the neoliberal system where you totally separate politics and, and uh, the central banks is not correctly designed for the new challenges. We need to go hand in hand and work a little bit better towards the same goals. And we need to question some of the neoliberal dogmas that has been in the last 30 years developing in the financial sector. And actually, some of the early neoliberals, even them wanted a more regulated financial system. So like even to their own ideology, it should not be too difficult. So um, we need to have a different mindset on the purpose of the financial sector, who is master and who is servant. Thank you. Lovely, thank you very much. Um, so I'd like to move on uh, the discussion to another topic that has also been uh, very important in Peter's uh, presentation, which is the question of central banks. Central banks uh, have a really important uh, stake or position in the monetary system of the day. Uh, they decide basically who gets the privilege of issuing money when they award a banking license, they oversee banks operation and uh, set the interest rates at which bank can borrow reserves. Uh, 
um, and they provide them emergency loans in case of need. Um, however, in recent decades, they've not interfered much with, with banks' money creation and have mostly refrained from um, making their own uh, policies climate sensitive, claiming that they are not climate policy makers, um, which Peter Ditch has argued is absolutely not the case and a fundamental misunderstanding. So we have with us Max Janek, who is a researcher in economics and was published on central banks before. Max, could you possibly give us some further details on, on central banks' role in the fight against climate change um, and how you think that it should change in the future? In particular, would you think what do you think of, of, of Professor Ditch's proposals um, to keep banks from issuing money for fossil fuel projects in the kind of some kind of credit guidance or some? Another uh, suitable uh, like, like, a like measure, or to reduce the, the the commercial bank's privilege of issuing money in the first place. Um, yes, I um, <clears throat> I very much agree with with Peter that we need some kind of credit guidance to guide credit uh, away from fossil fuels and toward green projects and uh, green technologies. Um, I'm not really convinced about the. The first proposal about um, stopping banks from issuing money altogether, because as you write in the in the article, it's it's one of the perhaps the central component that gives capitalism its dynamism. It's the decentralized ability to create credit and to invest in in uh, new ventures. Um, but uh, yes, we, we we need to to sort of. Uh, learn what what central banks used to do um, before the neoliberal era, so to speak, and in countries that have industrialized very fast, that have uh, where there was a a um, deliberate political project of achieving economic change, where and where countries deliberately industrialized, the central bank was almost always involved in steering credit toward certain projects. Uh, and away from others, so uh, away from real estate and towards industrialization. And I think um, that there is a lot to learn from history there. How to, uh, what kind of tools to use, and how how to, or first of all, the the actual mindset that uh, we we don't need to sort of fight inflation just by raising interest rates and, and kind of causing a credit crunch across the board. We can have qualitative restrictions we can choose where we want the, the credit to go we can we can stop giving credit to to fossil fuels and to other extractive industries that Carl was talking about uh, and we can we can promote credit for uh, more climate friendly projects and and the technologies that can replace fossil fuels um i i don't necessarily agree with Carl that this system is sort of designed to maximize production and to maximize growth. Um, as most loans, at least in Sweden, are made to buy existing assets. And uh, I think maybe we, we actually could learn from the era when central banks did try to, to maximize growth, although they were, of course, not, um, they did not care about the environment at all. Um, but they did have a mindset of maximizing the growth of new industries. And I think we can sort of use that sort of thinking to 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 grow the, the new industries that we need, and hopefully they will grow enough to to be able to um, replace fossil fuels. But of, of course, as we all agree here, not enough just to promote the creation of new green industries. We also need to actively scale down fossil fuels and scale down uh, the extraction of natural resources and logging and things like that. So. Um, my I have, my question that I would have for the panel is, to what extent can we use credit guidance today um, in a in a globalized in a deregulated financial system? Is it is it possible for central banks to to uh, engage in credit guidance, or do we have to have really thoroughgoing financial re-regulation before we can do that? Um, and I should note that the some central banks, the European central banks, for instance, has has been open to 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 uh, um, steering credit toward 
I mean, uh, in, in accordance with the Paris Agreement, that, that should make financial flows consistent and compatible with pathways to a low-carbon future. Um, the European Central Bank has been open to discussing what's called green TLTROs, targeted long-term refinancing operations, and uh, directing them toward green projects. Um, they've also been open to penalizing fossil fuel lending in their collateral frameworks. And as, uh, as you write in the article, you, you mention Shel Nibor's book about collateral frameworks. I think his book is, is really interesting because it really shows how political the, the process of credit allocation is uh, in Europe. It's, um, a lot of the lending is, is done by the ECB and it's, on, uh, it's not on market prices, it's a lot on theoretical prices derived by models that they use. Um, and also you have private credit rating institutions playing a huge role in this. So uh, it's not markets allocating credit as much as large public organizations and large private organizations as well. Um, if I understand your argument correctly, you, you are arguing for uh, um, re increased reliance on, on credit guidance, and you also already see seeds of this in, in current practices of, of central banks in a way. Yeah. Yes, but, but I think that this was sort of a pre-pandemic thing, that they were open to this before the pandemic, and since then they have kind of um, not moved forward on it, or it's been it's been lobbied away, but but I mean there there was a glimmer of hope there before the pandemic. I think wonderful. I think uh, your your question to the panel. We'll keep that for later, and we'll move on to our next panelist. Thank you very much, Thank Max, you. for your contribution. Our next panelist um, will be Björn Eriksson. Um, so we've um, talked a lot about problems with the money issued by banks, but not so much about the money that is issued by the state. And Björn Eriksson works for an organization that strives to increase the use of coins and notes uh, in society. And he argues that this could reduce banks' freedom to create money and thus uh, perhaps also uh, the problems caused by uh, banks to the environment. Um, for the audience in general, could you explain to us, Björn, how uh, an increasing use of cash could have this effect, and also um, what, from your point, viewpoint, are the merits of the proposition that uh, Peter Teach has made, that of uh, reducing um, uh, the uh, money issuance by banks and of some kind of credit guidance. Thank you. Thank you very much, and thank you very much, Peter Teach, for, for um, your speech too. I'm coming from another angle, as you uh, slightly indicate, and uh, representing a lot of the nonprofit organizations in my country. We go back a little bit to 2005 when uh, they took a decision in Sweden that it should be uh, more of a responsibility for the commercial banks to have uh, uh, access and take decisions concerning the payment system. And then um, I can see the meeting uh, when the bankers met, and the first question was, do we earn money on cash? Answer is no. Next question, do we earn more money on some sort of monopoly where uh, we can take fees and things of that sort? Yes, was that answer. And since then onwards, when we started to work, we worked along four lines, more or less. The first one, which had shouldn't take, uh, uh, talk more about just now, was people that is a little bit outside the system, those who are not profitable, was a kind of difficult to get the machinery working. You know, the politicians were reluctant to discuss it, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The next step was crisis management. And suddenly you have a situation when you started to discuss war or crisis in Europe, possibilities to switch off different type of... Uh, uh, money arrangement, and suddenly you could see some of some some renewed interest in this type of area. The third one, a little bit later on, was integrity. What does it mean that we collect information the way the bankers work? And we have reached the point that when we feel we are ready to join you, because we too ended up. What's the rule for the central bank? It was a journey. So you are probably more knowledgeable than we are about the different options. 
but we are there and we can see when we try to discuss with the central banks now that it's um, slightly more easy. They start to talk in a different way. And we have two problems. And this, is, this is slightly political. The first one is that the banks never talk to us. Never, never, never. And their idea is if we don't talk uh, with uh, anybody and discuss these type of questions, we will want win in the long run. And then they start one investigation. The government start to investigate. When you have the result, you start a new investigation. Nobody really want to take and take care to discuss the questions we are discussing. And consequently, I think one of the major things is to have the ordinary man to realize the problem. And that's why we are um, a little bit uh, just now. Uh, when you uh, look backwards uh, without being uh, an expert by no sense, I remember those days when I uh, myself was a banker working in um, on a commercial banks. The system we regulated in those days were um, functioned to a certain extent, but we got rid of all of that and consequently it's not so fundamental to discuss how do we guide this system but if the system should be that bankers don't talk to people and uh, they don't want to be governed then we have a real big problem so consequently look upon us as a uh, structure that try to influence the public in a broader sense rather than being specialized just in uh, the area we're discussing just now. Uh, good, good, good. Thank you very much. Yeah, so, so, so this to, to uh, create book money with um, minimal constraints, uh, it's more or more a question that is debatable among ordinary people. And that is a problem. Mm -hmm. You're referring to, to what exactly? Yeah. Sorry. So, so what, what is a problem among common people? Because when you try to start the discussion about central banks, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, it's kind of difficult. You have to describe this in a very uh, sort of easy way. In the beginning, when you could say that if you are a uh, woman living in a, a, a very violent marriage and uh, her safety could be cash because that's the only way that people can control her. If you take people with handicaps, et cetera, et cetera, it's very clear. You understand exactly. If you take mm -hmm. young, young people, they start discussing, we don't like that you try to take away cash. If you Absolutely. refer to cameras, face identification, et cetera, et cetera, yes. they see another society. Yes, of course. Yeah, you have uh, in in the cash debate. Um, no, yeah, there's um, exactly. different worlds clashing. I guess we all agree on that. Uh, it's, but it's we have very... reached the state of being ready to discuss the role of the central bank because, after all, all when you are listening yeah. to, uh, to Peter's yes. uh, description, Not completely if we don't opinion. do anything there, we will have it doesn't help if I start talking only on small groups. You have to see okay. the problem from okay. the. I see your point. Thank you very much for your contribution. Okay. Um, and uh, now we'll we'll head on to our uh, next uh, to our last participant, which is uh, Janine Arm Eriksson, uh, who has in, been in the Swedish Parliament for more than ten years. Um, Janine, you are interested in both uh, questions of climate change and economic questions. And what I'd be interested in is to hear more about um, what role bank regulation plays in discussions about climate policy. Uh, in general, in, in your experience, um, is there an, is is that an overlap uh, of topics that is often considered? And if not, do you think that the proposals that were being discussed might show us a way forward, or might be an interesting uh, subject of considerations in the future? Uh, thank you, thank you for the question and for arranging the seminar, and also uh, thank you, uh, Peter, for a very good presentation with the. Uh, very interesting proposals. Um, we here share, uh, I think, the same picture of the very uh, gravity of the situation, uh, which is now unfolding in front of our eyes. I think we all had uh, 
some hopes that the Paris Agreement would, you know, change uh, fundamentally the way investments work. And uh, the presentation here just showed us that, uh, and and news every day for that matter. But uh, some figures here would really um, made me think a little bit more because on the news you hear every day. But you we also see that the effects um, and that the emissions is not going down. Uh, they are increasing all the time when when we should and had hoped to see uh, that the Paris Agreement had, you know, turned the whole investment situation into renewables and not fossil. Uh, but but as as you just said, that is not the case. And of course, that is very worrying. And uh, from a polity, <clears throat> sorry, standpoint, I mean, we are working very broadly uh, to manage this climate crisis. Uh, and we have issued one big thing in our uh, in, in our policy and in our budget is, is uh, to borrow money to make the climate transition now quickly and, uh, and um, uh, to end uh, to to minimize uh, emissions and also um, um, help all the people that are now affected by climate change, but um, we see that it is not enough, as your figures very clearly stated. So we have to uh, be open to other ideas to regulate this. I think, and for a long time, and as we has been working, uh, has also been on. Um, um, um and consumer pressure uh, that our our peoples have seen that the climate change is is so severe that they would put pressure on their banks uh, not to lend money to to fossil fuel uh, companies for example uh, we see a small uh, change to that in a few swedish banks uh, uh, fair finance guide uh, is working with this and tracking this in a very good way, uh, but it's far too slow. And uh, the figures today shows us that we must much, much more. So um, putting up more regulations uh, is of course one way, um, because we also see that what we've learned since uh, the Yellow Vests in, in France, uh, more or less is that uh, ordinary people does not really see uh, the need to change this economic system and the principle of polluter pays, which is uh, in many cases shown with putting taxes on what on on, on emissions, uh, has not uh, really worked in a in a broader sense and for for ordinary people, and that uh, is also why we have to I think look into more regulation. We still need to to make sure that there are enough investments uh, for those who want to be in the green transition and wants to be in a in a safe uh, society and uh, not um, using uh, our capacity over our planetary boundaries. Uh, but uh, but for those who does not that who puts profit first and thinks that we can earn a little bit money more out of this before we change our behavior. Uh, I think it's time that we really we really need to make sure that this uh, stops because otherwise, uh, also as stated, uh, we can pour very much money into this and we will still not be able to turn this whole situation around. And as we all know, we have to keep the fossil fuels uh, uh, in the ground and develop other things. And uh, I think this is an interesting proposal that we will have reason to come back and discuss some more. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. So as far as I understand it, you're also in favor of uh, credit guidance proposals, um, sort of keeping banks from loaning to polluting industries as, as an interesting perspective. Um, it seems that there's quite some agreement has alluded to this question already. I think it's all planning. Uh, yeah, what are the prospects, the political prospects of this kind of proposal? Um, do, you, do you have any opinion on this, Janine? Uh, is there anything you want to share with us? 
Uh, sorry, I lost you there uh, for a while. My connection no, just no, dropped. I hope it's going to be better. So um, my question was, um, it seems that there's quite a, a, an agreement on, you know, the desirability of having some kind of credit guidance, keeping banks from, you know, like issuing money for um, socially destructive goals and projects. Um, and I think the question that burns on all our lips uh, is, and has already been a uh, question uh, asked by Max, is, um, you know, what's the prospects of this in a real political framework? Yeah, how are the chances of uh, credit guidance getting getting actually implemented somewhere? Do you have a divisibility on this, Janine? Uh, yes, I think it will be uh, very difficult <laughs> in a broader political perspective, unfortunately. Uh, I think the uh, the proposal is interesting and uh, really worthy to, to look into more. Uh, but uh, it will, of course, meet very much uh, um, opposition, I would say, uh, especially since we see a development uh, here in Sweden, but also in other parts that um, everyone will put climate change away from their own uh, responsibility and their own agenda uh, when we really need to be more into it together. Uh, but uh, as we have uh, worked with uh, making the pension funds more, uh, investing more sustainably. And uh, that has also been a very big struggle and uh, where we also now see a backlash, unfortunately. Uh, but uh, so, I think we have to be open to have many different tools uh, as we usually are in, in the Green Party, but uh, I think they will, it will be very difficult and take a lot of work to get more uh, parties on to seeing uh, the necessity of this. Yes, excellent. Thank you very much. And um, so as we are now nearing the end of uh, the exclusive panel section, um, Peter, would you have any uh, comments that you want to give us uh, uh, on any of the uh, uh, remarks that were made? Thanks, Georg. Well, there, there's been a lot of agreement, which which uh, uh, you know uh, is nice. Um, but maybe I maybe I'll just pick up on a on a few points before we open discussion. But uh, please stop me after after three minutes because I want to give other people the. Uh, possibility to ask their questions too. So um, I'll go in, in chronological order. Carl first. Uh, I mean, thank thank you for your comments. I mean, in a way, you're being much more radical than I am, right? I'm I'm taking one particular problem and I'm saying, look, we have to make it known that this is a problem because it's currently not known, and then do something about it, right? And you're saying, well, you know, growth is also a problem, inequality is also a problem. I agree, right? I I agree with those things. I think you know, coming back to the feasibility point that we just discussed. If we lump them all together, we make it even harder to change things. Right? Plus, I'm you know, the link to growth. I'm not entirely convinced whether the current monetary arrangements that we have absolutely require growth. In one sense, I agree. Getting rid of the credit overhang will have a negative impact. Right. So that's a challenge, and that's been acknowledged by financial experts. The link to inequality. That's an interesting one. I think we we need to work a lot more with carbon rebates that again links to something Janine just said right to to make the transition work for ordinary people if they lose out then we see something like the yellow vest movement right so a carbon rebate arrangement where uh, we make fossil fuel use and production more difficult without burdening the you know average citizen financially i think that's that's something that we have to work on um uh, Max, thank thank you for your comments. I mean, you you're you're one of the people who I anticipate in the paper who will think that the first policy proposal is maybe a little too radical, reduce credit altogether because it's good for the economy, and who's favorable to the second. I anticipate that, and I I don't have any particular allegiances when it comes to these policy proposals. All I want to show is that there are things that can be done, right? Uh, and it's actually interesting to point out that a lot of these things were discussed post financial crisis two thousand eight not even in the climate context, but just in the financial stability context, the mm. problem is hardly hardly any of them got done. Right? So that's that's the challenge. And I think that's what we need to what we need to work on. And I also appreciate your 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 comments about the um the discussions at the ECB. Uh, and I agree that they show that this is a deeply political process. Right? Um, now I think that that's one of the deep challenges that the central banks want to play an apolitical game. Mm. There are 
they're in up into up to their neck in in deeply political questions right so how do we as a society society resolve that that's something that needs to be institutionally addressed right um because otherwise there's a disconnect um now uh bjorn um i you know i i, I agree with you that this this switch away from cash to payment systems creates several kinds of injustices. I'm not sure yet that, that your challenges that you face in that context overlap directly, directly with the challenges that, that I've been outlining here. They might, right? Um, but one, one thing that the two challenges definitely share is that in order to do something about them, and I completely agree with you on that point, is that you, you have to make ordinary people realize that there is a problem and what that problem consists in. Um, and you're right when you point out that, you know, I, I have my work cut out in this context here to, to make that case, right? I, I, I've, I've worked to break it down into relatively simple bits. Look, this is how the interaction between central banks and commercial banks works. And this is why it's a problem for climate change. But it's still fairly complicated, right? Um, and to, to get public pressure for change in that context whether it's uh, more cash or whether it's reducing commercial lending to fossil fuels, that that case has to be crystal clear. Um, um, and finally, uh, Janine, so I, I already um, uh, shared my my concern about the the you know making the transition work for uh, for the average citizen. Um, you, like others in the discussion, put a lot of emphasis on the proposals. Um, the proposals, as as I just said in, in response to Max, for me are, are, are more just a a uh, an element that is necessary to show that something can be done. What's more important for me is agreement on the dynamics that are actually problematic in in our current monetary arrangements. That link between how it currently works and emissions. Right? If we can agree on that factual link, that would already be huge. What we then do about it in the end is is a is a secondary question. Um, now I'm I'm uh, I'm heartened by the fact that you see that there's some change in Swedish banks here in Canada. We also see some change. You know, I'm I'm with a credit union. The credit union is much better about who they lend money to, right? Uh, but the credit union is small fry compared to the uh, big six Canadian banks. Who, if you look at the banking on uh, on climate climate uh, chaos report. Are, are world leaders, unfortunately, in leading in lending to uh, to fossil fuels. Um, anyway, I'll, I'll I'll leave it there, and I look forward to continuing the discussion with some questions from the uh, from the audience. Thanks, thank, thank you, you all for your, for your comments. Thank you very much, Peter, and the rest of the of the panel. It's been a lovely discussion, and we'll now uh, head on to questions from the audience. The first one uh, has been asked by Kirill Pochilov. Um, and it is uh, why uh, turning banks into intermedi intermediaries would be a radical proposal. Uh, Kirill wants to know uh, basically uh, who granted them this, this right to print money and uh, he feels excluded uh, from, from not being able to print money. Yeah, um, yeah I guess, you know, one, one of the things he's presumably referring to is that uh, you know, like uh, making banks pure intermediaries doesn't forcibly spell disaster. Um, it's quite possible that um, you know, public sector, for instance, could take over a part of the of the of the responsibility of making loans and direct them into socially uh, desirable goals. Um, and of course, um, also um, making banks intermediaries does not spell the end of, of credit at all. Yeah, it just means that banks do not have the possibility of creating money when they get, get, give out loans and have to finance all their lending in full. What's, what's your take on, on this matter? I mean, we've, we've heard from Max before that you believe that uh, this kind of proposition would uh, sort of take the dynamism out of uh, capitalism, if I remember that correctly. Um, is there any, anyone else who wants to come in? I, I could maybe kick things off with a uh, with a little story that Maurice Allais, the French uh, Nobel laureate in, in economics, uh, used to tell. Right, he he would compare uh, the process of counterfeiting and money creation by uh, by financial institutions. Right, he would say, "Look, uh, 
if I go and set up a printing machine in my garage and print cash, right, I, I get sent to prison. Um, but if a bank creates money and it has a banking license, then that's perfectly okay under the way that we've set things up. Right? Uh, but but I think you know Kirill and others who, who are asking similar questions have a point when they say, well, this still seems quite crazy that some people can just do this. Right? Um, so it, I, I agree that this is this is radical, but on the other hand, we have to appreciate that this is the status quo. Right? Uh, so from the perspective of the status quo, taking that privilege away and taking away all the benefits that this privilege in the past, as, as Max has uh, uh, highlighted, that the benefits that this privilege has had for economic growth and for our societies, that seems radical now for some, right? So it, it, it's a matter it's a matter of perspective, I think, where you uh, where you start from, and this is why it's important to point out the negative consequences of the current arrangement now, to make it uh, make it seem less less radical to uh, to go for a reform. Good, thank you very much. Um, the second question comes from a uh, participant called Paul. And uh, it's a pretty long question, so I'm having uh, issues understanding that. But as far as I understand it, um, what Paul wants to know is if we sort of shift credits out um, of of uh, fossil fuels, couldn't be couldn't it be a problem or an issue that um, the overconsumption that sort of now goes into fossil fuels will afterwards go into, for instance, rare earth minerals? Um, might there be a, a similar problem with incorrectly, uh, uh, in, incompletely corrected externalities with regards to rare earth minerals? And should this also be a target of, of credit guidance, perhaps? Who wants to respond on that? I can, I can take a, or Janine, go ahead. Well, you can go also, Peter, but I, I wanted to refer back to what Carl said before, that uh, maybe if we do uh, regulations like this, it's not only on fossil fuels, but also uh, uh, other extractions like uh, rare minerals and so on, uh, in order to have regulations that not only uh, um, is in, in the fossil fuels, but also other planetary boundaries that we have and uh, that we want to preserve. Um, um, uh, biodiversity. So I, I think uh, I refer back to what Carl said earlier and that that was, uh, I think, also necessary in order to not have this uh, effect. Yes, so I guess that's the reasonable position to take here. Yeah. Um, I'm still wondering whether uh, anybody in the panel is able, or among the technical people, is able to bring the people who ask the questions into the panel. Kindly let me know if you know. Uh, for the time being, we'll, we'll just go on like this. Um, the next quiz question comes from somebody called Chris Wood. Um, and I'll just read out the question. It goes as follows. Who will mandate the identification and inclusion of all externalities into the economic analysis that underlies a decision to lend? Um, So that is presumably a question that also refers to uh, credit guidance. What do you see? Uh, do you see what? Yeah. It means? So if if I can, I mean, it it, it kind of raises an, an underlying issue which I didn't include in the presentation. So I think if you have credit guidance, you, you know, you could have guidelines that don't necessitate the identification of all externalities. Right? You could just say, okay, this is the stuff that you can lend to. This is the stuff that you can't lend to. Or this is the stuff you can lend to up to this threshold. This is the you know you can't go beyond that threshold. But but one question which you know all, all that I said earlier uh, raises is uh, why we should be optimistic that we can do this credit guidance uh, if we can't do the internalization of the externalities that Chris refers to in the first place. Right? Uh, this brings us back to what Janine said about feasibility. Well, is this going to be tough? Is this going to be any less tough than having a more forceful carbon tax? Because if we had a more forceful carbon tax, if we had fully internalized externalities, none of these 
commercial banks would be lending to fossil fuels in the first place. Right? Um, and I think the answer or, or my reason to be uh, optimistic about, about this, uh, uh, this project here is that uh, the non-internalization of externalities is already well known, but it's still not happening. This, uh, on the other hand, as Bjorn and others have pointed out, is something that is not well known yet. Right? So by making it better known, we could increase pressure on politicians to act on something, whichever it might be more internalization of externalities or credit guidance or something else. And it increases the political pressure. And I think that's that's where the promise lies. I think Max wanted to come in on that one too. Yes, I just wanted to to, uh, to say something about the um, the idea that uh, internalizing externalities through a carbon price. And I guess that even if you, I mean, if, if you could do that, it would stop the lending to fossil fuels. But I don't think that even if you were able to put a price on carbon that was fully internalized in externalities, I don't think that would solve the problem of of uh, channeling credits to uh, green industries, to uh, new technologies, because uh, investors, I mean, I'm just making the simple Keynesian point here that investors can always keep their money liquid. They can always invest in existing assets. They can buy real estate. They can buy uh, financial assets. Uh, so uh, even if there was a massive price on carbon, that doesn't mean that they would lend toward new battery technologies and new um, renewable energy technologies that are that are unproven. It it would channel more credit to the to the established technologies that are already on the market, but it wouldn't help channeling credit to uh, the next frontier and the more advanced technologies that are still that where there's still a lot of technology uncertainty. So. I just wanted to point that out that that uh, putting a price on carbon would would only wouldn't solve uh, that problem. Excellent, thank you very much. Um, the next question that isn't sort of repetitive um, comes from from Andrew Miller, and I'll sort of paraphrase this a bit. Um, his his uh, concern is that most production activities, human production activities, cause some kind of issue. Um, for the climate, uh, for the environment, um, and he wonders whether we will be able to discriminate, uh, uh, you know, the production activities which are, you know, harm, really harmful or something from from those that are just a little bit harmful. Where do we? Isn't this sort of some kind of sliding slope scenario? Where do we? Where do we set the points? Um, why is it only fossil fuel, and why is it not other? you know, like um, activities uh, that might be harmful to our environments that we want to prohibit uh, when we do credit guidance. Any ideas on that? Go ahead, Carl. Yes, I agree. And this is exactly what we have been doing. Recently, Greenpeace has been guiding companies to to do investment policies also regulating impacts on biodiversity and this is very difficult also that because it depends on whose biodiversity you destroy we tend to move away environmental cost to people with less and less power to defend themselves so this is a general problem of, of the system and, and therefore i'm more towards pre-designing it uh, so it doesn't always need to expand in all sectors so that is one of the arguments why I think it's important to rein this in. But there are now more and more companies developing also guidelines for how to measure impact on biodiversity and other issues. All right, thank you, Peter. If I can just add one point to that, I mean, this is one of the one of the areas where I completely agree with Carl that problems are interlinked. Right? If we if we do stop growth if we um, uh, go either for a, a uh, steady state economy or even for degrowth it becomes crucially important that we address the issue of inequality right? um, because it's only under the, the constantly expanding uh, economic system uh, that the high earners and the rich are able to extract more and more rents from the system uh, without everyone else just falling into, into destitution, right? If we if we have a system that no longer grows, there needs to be a more just distribution of uh, uh, of the benefits from the social cooperation, right? Which which arguably today some are are, are unjustly benefiting off anyway. Uh, 
Um, so this is one of the points where I agree that we can't solve the one uh, without addressing the other. Um, Wonderful, thank you very much. So the next question comes from Joe Polito, and what Joe Polito wants to know is whether uh, the introduction of central bank digital currencies uh, could facilitate the changes to address climate change. Um, what's what's your what's your take on this topic? You know, you can you can use central bank digital currencies to do anything you want. You can uh, that I think that's orthogonal to the issue that we're discussing here, right? Um, central bank digital currencies uh, they, they they do give the central bank more more control over the financial system. The question then becomes, well. Does that go hand in hand with taking away some of the privileges that commercial banks have today or not? Right? If it doesn't, then I don't see it, it solving any of the problems that we have here. Now, of course, you can imagine a, uh, a central bank digital currency reform that does involve taking some of these privileges away, in which case it would it would yield benefits uh, uh, for climate mitigation. Right? Um, but in itself, I don't think it, it addresses the issue. I don't know. Maybe others disagree on that. No, I agree. But one point there is it opens up for other competitive payment systems and organization logics that would not be dependent on the current financial and banking system, which could possibly open up for more bottom up solutions. That's maybe a small link, but I don't think it's like a panacea or real solution, but it helps a little bit in, in creating more alternative solutions. Excellent. Thank you very much. So I think we'll we'll go to the last question from from the audience. Uh, the last one that's sort of <laughs> slow, so that I uh, sort of um, um, short, so that I can understand it. It comes from Ewald Kornmann, and uh, it is um, it's basically wondering why uh, we we've not sufficiently talked about um, the issuance of money with interest. Um, he claims that basically. The issuance of money at interest is the fundamental cause of um, the growth imperative um, of, of our current uh, economy, as, as Carl has claimed as well. But given we've already had Carl on this, maybe somebody else wants to jump in. Uh you know, I'll refer you to the work of someone else. It's unpublished. It was presented at that at that conference that uh, Samuel mentioned at the beginning of our webinar today, um, where uh, Alexander Douglas presented a paper where he said, "Look, we should we should set the interest in the economy to zero in order to prevent capitalists from making profit." Right? Uh, now, uh, would that solve some of the problems in the context of climate change? Interesting question. Right? Um, it's certainly another radical proposal out there, uh, and it's certainly worth thinking about. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, the, I think in terms of the realistic reform uh, proposals here, the question is always how much do you put on the table? Right? The more radical you are, the less chances you have to get uh, to get anywhere. Um, at least to some extent, that was my strategy in the paper to bite off as small a piece as I could in order to get as mileage, as much mileage as I, uh, as I can. Um, whether so it goes anywhere. Is a, is, a, is a good sort of intermediate solution, not too radical, but still uh, in the, in the range of the possible. Um, wonderful. I think we are, we are sort of at the end of, of, of the webinar. It was fascinating two hours with Peter Teach and a wonderful panel of highly intelligent uh, discussants. Thank you very much uh, for all your contributions. Um, we'll close this here. Thank you very much for the audience for having sticked with us for so long. Um, I hope it's been interesting to you people. Um, feel free to um, follow us uh, on our social media channels. Have a look at um, our website. We are Positiva Pengar and there's a couple of other co-organizing um, uh, organizations which you'll find all the emails that you got. Um, we thank you for your attention and we wish you a wonderful evening or whatever other time of the day it might be where you are. Um, all the best from us at Positiva Bengar and uh, thank you very much. Goodbye.